How do you find conscious partners to have a conscious relationship? Perhaps you have been divorced or have broken up from a long-term relationship and you're like, I don't want to keep repeating the same pattern over and over again. Why do I keep attracting the abuser? Do I have a better partnership? This is what this video is going to address. Three of us can go through our perspectives on this. Mm -hmm. So the patterns in bad relationships that some people tend to repeat over and over again is a result of unhealed childhood wounds. We're trying to replay the dynamic of the wounds in childhood unconsciously through our romantic partner because we're energetically drawn, most of us are anyways, mm -hmm. energetically drawn to like, oh, I don't know what it is about that guy or that girl. I can't, I can't get enough of her, I can't get enough of him. But yet we have so much drama and arguments, but I can't leave. I know I should, my logical brain says, I should leave this relationship, but like, oh, the passion, we, we go up, the passion is so hot, and then we come down, and we trigger each other so much. So this is the source of eroticism and passion, but the conflict is caused by the unhealed childhood wounds. So let's take the example of the people who are attracted to, let's say, abusers. They've witnessed abuse at home, or maybe they've been abused sexually, physically, emotionally, and when they meet somebody that is unconsciously reminding them of the energy mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the mom or the dad that they have unfinished business with. They're like, I can't stop thinking about this person. And then you're mm -hmm. recreating that drama and that person is also broken in their own way. Mm -hmm. And so in order to find a more conscious partner, it's going to be almost impossible to find a more conscious partner until you heal the little girls or the little boys inside of you mm -hmm. that have been abused. I think you've just defined in detail unconscious relationship y yes and uh, and you know what the the first thing one of the first things that you said was I don't know why I'm so attracted to this person mm -hmm. and that is basically stating I am unconscious about what's happening here mm -hmm. it just goes up and goes down mm -hmm. and so yeah and you define that and and given wonderful like examples of psychological explanation of why that's happening and so yeah when I'm here hear that I'm hearing that, okay, if I want to find a conscious partner, I need to be more self-aware, more conscious about mm -hmm. what's happening in me. Yeah. Why am I attracted to the people that I'm attracted to? How did I get into that relationship before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What really, what are the parts that come up for me in relationship, mm -hmm. both at the beginning, middle, and end of a relationship? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so bringing consciousness to a relationship is the first way to get yourself into a conscious relationship. Yes. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you're going to stop being attracted to the person that reminds you of your father or your mother that did you wrong. The only way that this kind of relationship is going to work in a conscious way is if the other person has also done inner healing. Then the both of you become, as Dr. Dick Schwartz says, the secondary healers mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. your child parts. Yes. Because a therapist or a coach can shine a 20 watt light bulb into the dark past of the frozen parts of you in old traumatic events. So you work mm -hmm. on yourself, the self heals and reparents all these child parts. Mm -hmm. Then when you meet your match, that's like, oh, can't get enough of him or her. That's when you, if you both recognize, oh, you're reminding me of my father. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know that when you don't empty the dishwasher, Timely, and I ask you to, it's like reminding me of when my father did not listen to my mother and I feel unimportant. I know it's my issue, I've already killed that little girl, but you know that that's one of my trigger points. When I get do get frustrated with the dishwasher, like being closed for three days, mm -hmm. and I'm so busy, I've been on a trip. I just want you to know that that gets triggered. Right. And so if you could understand that that's why I've gotten mad at you in the past. Yeah. So can you help me with that part? All right, so that's a, a, mm -hmm. a conscious conversation. Very conscious. Hella conscious conversation yes. in a relationship. Mm -hmm. One question that I want to get to is, okay, you're in the single world now mm -hmm. and you're not in a relationship. Mm -hmm. How do you find a conscious relationship? For me, I believe that's a matter of taking responsibility for my own consciousness and bringing that consciousness into relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. And that is where, wherever you are. So in other words, you start speaking for your parts. You bring consciousness to the, to the dating process. That means you start speaking for yourself. How would you talk about that in the early phases, let's say the first or second date? 
first second or second day. day. How about, I mean, even like when I'm first meeting someone at a cocktail party, like it starts right away. Mm -hmm. It starts with, yeah, so I like, I noticed you. I'm not sure why, but I found you really attractive. Mm -hmm. And That's such a great, oh my it's God. not even a pickup line. I know. That is just so, that would make oh, me melt. That would make <laughs> All right, let's say yeah. that again. I've noticed you. That's it. It's for the Well, this is just speaking, you. right? This is yeah. just speaking for my parts and what's going on with me. Yeah. So, hey, I, I noticed you. Something made me want to come over here and talk to you. I'm not yeah. sure what it is, but I'm interested to find out. Are you occupied right now? <laughs> oh, God, that would just know, make me right? melt. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. You know, mm. can you imagine saying that as a woman? No, I probably wouldn't do that. Hmm. But I would have co other different conversations to show my uh, interest. Like you're dropping the handkerchief. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm. To be more yes. dropping the handkerchief. Yes. That's, that's, that's some other dating coach. Yes. That, that metaphor. Yeah. So I should throw, say I've had... Throw the softball or throw the tennis ball mm. so that you don't feel because from what I read, the number one fear of men is fear of rejection. Rejection, sure. I want to pause right there because I am currently dating someone who, a woman who did do that, who did do that for okay. me. Okay. I, I want to give women permission to, to do that and say it's okay and a lot of, and it can be very successful. Yeah. And right, there, there is the dropping of the handkerchief, there are the more subtle cues which can be useful, but a lot of times the guy's not going to read that. Yeah. But, um, you know, this is a, a person who, I guess there was eye contact on a dance floor. It's not going where you think it is. Um, so, but, you know, it's just like, okay, you know, this person was, you know, came and, and danced next to me and we were, we were just dancing and looking at each other and we started dancing with each other. I, I said something to her, just asked her who she is, you know, who, who's her friend. And I was like, okay, you know, thank you. Nice to meet you. I thought I was just going to go my own separate way and then as I was walking away she came up and she said I really would like to have a, another conversation with you but I'm hanging out with my friend would you like to take my number? But Percy, mm -hmm. you spoke to her first on the dance floor you said. You said there was eye contact between you two, right? Mm -hmm. So you said something to her on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. What did you and say? And then, just what, Michael chit chat, right? Oh, okay. That's what yeah. I, got, I got out of that. I talked with her about this later okay. on. Okay. Uh, if you're watching, I'm not gonna identify you. <laughs> when we talked about this, she told me, and there, there's stuff that I don't even remember, yeah. which is the, which is one, I said, oh, I talked to you first. And she said, yeah, but I saw you and I came up and I danced next to you on purpose. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you were doing yeah. that. So She's like, yeah, and I, accident that. and I accidentally bumped into you. And I'm like, oh, I don't even remember that happening. Yeah. So I thought I was making the first move. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, you totally picked me up, didn't you? And she's like, yeah, I kind of did. I'm but like, that's oh, what sure. women do, right? That's the dropping the handkerchief. That is the yeah. dropping the handkerchief. Yeah, so, so it's up to women to show their interest. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. and, it, and a lot of times it's nonverbal. And we're oblivious, like, just, just to say, I was oblivious to that. Yeah. I was oblivious that she was showing her interest. Well, do you think that, that that's pretty common with, with men, right? They don't necessarily always pick up on the obvious. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, I guess it's true yeah. for me because yeah. I didn't pick up on that. But the energy was right. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you were obviously attracted to her, so you initiated the conversation. So she knew, she felt comfortable mm -hmm. that you were interested in her as well. Right. A lot of times, women are making the first move. This woman asked me out on the first night. She asked for the change of contact information. She um, asked for the first date and the second date. And that was, that was okay. For me, that's not a problem. And it's just like, we get along great. It's mm. terrific. So I want women to feel like they have permission to do that and to show interest in whatever way they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So then what does that do to the masculine feminine polarity? Sure, we're, we're kind of be in a little bit of the coy masculine to drop their handkerchief so that you can respond in your masculine. masculine. Mm -hmm. But then if she's initiating more stuff, how does that feel in terms of, okay, I'm in the masculine, she's supposed to surrender, or she being too masculine okay. and is just not when, creating the polarity? When you talk about masculine and feminine, it might be a good idea for us to define those. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Because I think when we talk about that, it kind of perpetuates a sense that women are supposed to be this way and men are supposed to be this way. I don't think that we really want to do that. One way that, I guess I've done a lot of workshops at something called the New Tantra, which is, which is a European kind of a modern guide to Tantra. 
uh, and they do lovely workshops. What they're talking about is really in any dynamic that's going to be, you know, hot and have a polarity. Mm -hmm. One partner is, is serving and the other partner is surrendering. Correct. Right. And I'd rather define it that way because, you know, I've been coached on relationships that didn't work because I feel like I'm supposed to be the masculine. So in masculine is, is quote unquote masculine would be the serving. So I would always be serving and that just burnt out. Mm -hmm. Actually, <laughs> those roles have to switch. One, one person might, might be more comfortable on one role mm -hmm. than the other. And that might gradually shift in the, you know, towards the uh, beginning, middle and end of the relationship. But you do have to have those two separate roles at any given time mm -hmm. in order for there to be a polarity. Yeah, and I think there is yeah. a give and take in that. But if we look at like the initial stages of um, attraction, mm -hmm. to me it f it feels better as a woman when the man is kind of taking control of it as opposed mm -hmm. to looking to me. And I can say as somebody who's a mother of young adult children who's a bit older, I don't want to feel in the mother role. I don't want to feel a mother role. And I'm perfectly capable of organizing everything and you know asking this guy out and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. But that's not a role that I feel like makes me feel that feminine energy. And I'm glad you defined that because it's more of an energy. More of an energy of surrender. Femininity and right. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to surrender and relax. I want mm -hmm. to relax into the masculine. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. want to feel like <clears throat> I'm taking, I don't have to do everything mm -hmm. to make this go forward because otherwise that, when that happens, I feel anxious. Right. I would... Question, when you say as a, as a woman you feel this way, maybe you mean as a person who's primarily feminine. Uh, yes, yeah. in my feminine energy, primarily. And you bring up a good point because there are men who operate more out of their, ma their feminine energy. Absolutely. And vice versa for women. But what happens with- they make great matches. And they, yeah. and they do because it's polarity. Right. But I think where women struggle is they take on the masculine because of their triggered parts that kill that polarity. If you have two people trying to serve one another, correct, it's going to kill the polarity. If you have two people that are trying to surrender, yeah, it's going to kill the polarity exactly. because it's like, oh, you know, I'll do whatever you want to do. No, honey, I'll do whatever you yeah. want to do. Exactly. And that is not sexy at all. Yes. Exactly. Well, David Dita, he's the guy that's uh, the, the guru in spiritual uh, spiritual sex sexuality, says that. 80% of women have natural feminine essence. Yes. They're born, you could ask yourself, am I really, do I want to surrender, be the girly, like take care of me? So 80% of women identify themselves as feminine, uh, as um, yeah, feminine, and 80% of men identify themselves as primarily mm -hmm. masculine. 10% of men identify themselves as feminine, and 10% of women identify themselves as masculine. And then the remaining 10% are people who are more in the middle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. neutral. So they tend to attract other people who are more neutral. The masculine person, essence person, is attracted to the person, feminine essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this also speaks to parts of us. We all have masculine and feminine parts, but I think if you're naturally masculine, you want to be able to take ownership, especially in the initial stages. Mm -hmm. Then, as the relationship goes on, then you could be flip-flopping, mm -hmm. which makes it mm -hmm. very interesting because yes. now you get to bring out, oh, okay, yes. I get to bring out my masculine parts. Yes. Yeah. And he gets to, like, surrender. But, but in, in beginnings of relationship, men and women are typically on different emotional timelines, and women want to know the answers, and they want to get to the end. They want to know that this is the guy for them. And the guy's just trying to figure out, how do I feel about her? Those parts of her get way. triggered in that she feels like now I have to lean forward and whatever's going on inside of her parts, I gotta take control of this and I gotta figure this out, scares a lot of men away and rightly so. One question that you asked was the woman initiating, how does that affect the masculine and feminine mm -hmm. polarity? I would say in this case, when we met, I was dancing. I was on the dance floor. I was just completely surrendering to the music. You were in the feminine. Yeah. Dancing is I was the in a surrender. I was in a surrender mode at that time. Mm -hmm. At that point, she was in a masculine in a in a serving role. You know, she did whatever she needed to do to initiate it. I being in the in the in the surrender mode was receptive to it. Mm -hmm. It sounded great to me, and it, it was nice. But that being said, like that is not necessarily how our relationship is, we'll keep a polarity by, by switching back and forth and I'll be in one role and she'll be in the other role. Sometimes I'm conscious of it, but a lot of times it's just like, okay, you know, I feel like surrendering right now. Yeah. And she'll serve. And then other times like, I'll feel like I, I, will, I will serve 
it will be a matter of building trust in order for that person to surrender on both ends. Mm -hmm. well, especially that yeah. that plays itself out in the bedroom and during sex. Mm -hmm. Nothing yeah. wrong with yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's part of the fun. Right. You circle back to our original question, how do you find a more conscious partner? You know, the number one answer is you have to work on yourself. That means like more than going to a Tony Robbins event mm -hmm. or some 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 rah-rah thing and reading books. It means hopefully finding an internal family systems therapist or coach because mm -hmm. this is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And Denise has shared her story mm -hmm. of the transformation that in just two short months that has mm -hmm. gotten her to her higher self. Then when you model the courageous vulnerability conversations, mm -hmm. you could see mm -hmm. how that can translate into dating mm -hmm. from the very first date because mm -hmm. you could tease out Yes. Tease out whether or not this guy can even receive your courageous vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. you know, I'm learning in therapy that I have this part in your life. And if he's like, yeah. not going there. Yeah. Or so I'm seeing two steps here. One, presence. Mm -hmm. Like becoming conscious of what's happening in you, mm -hmm. which, is, which is that step. And two is, is honesty, integrity. Mm -hmm. Meaning you've explored your parts, you know your parts, you're conscious of what's going on, you're conscious that you're attracted to someone, and speaking for it. Mm -hmm. Really owning the fears of speaking for it. You know, you can, you can say, hey, let's, I'm kind of nervous, I don't normally do this. Yeah, yeah. love it, love it. Right? Yeah, and it's just like, that. okay, I'm being vulnerable, they can put their sword down, they don't have to have yeah. the shield up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So I'd say presence to what's happening for you, and honesty, the honesty to speak for what's happening yeah. for you. Yeah. And that's just the same as how we ended the relationship, which is speaking for what's going on mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. It's the way that you can start a relationship. It's the way that you can be in the middle of a relationship. Yeah. So really speaking for your own experience. I know when I'm meeting somebody new, um, I don't do interrogation. I, don't, I think that's really uncomfortable. And I'm interested in people. Everybody has a story and I'm always interested in learning. So I'm just, when I'm out on a date, I'm more just trying to get to know that person. I'm not really, I don't have an agenda. Usually in conversation, it'll come up, like say if there's a divorce, and then I will try and be vulnerable about that, about my part in my divorce. And then I'll usually, uh, you know, through conversation, ask the person, well, you know, looking back, how do you think you might have been able to do things differently? Hmm. What did you learn from that relationship? What might you, what? yeah, that's another what approach. What did you learn about yourself? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. So it's very non-threatening. I will share something of myself first to kind of lay that, you know, it's safe to do so. Right. If it's I'm doing it, vulnerable. then yeah, exactly. And I find people are most open the first time that you meet them, the first couple right. times, and then kind of the walls come up. But I like that always going, when it comes to opening up more vulnerability in the relationship, yeah. being willing to go first. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a saying that people are always waiting for you, for someone else to go first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you can hear the response. So if the person comes back and they could come back and say, geez, you know what? I've never really thought about that. Like that would be interesting for somebody to say. Or they may say, oh, you know, I learned X, Y, and Z about myself. But if they refuse to take ownership or look at themselves and consistently blame the other person, then I know that we're just not on the same level. That would not be a match. That would be somebody who is hasn't done enough work to become mm -hmm. conscious. Yes. And then you're over here. It's like, okay, that yes. person is still blaming, criticizing their ex. Right. Yes. The recipe for disaster. When I know everybody because I had my own part in my relationships. So you you can come to terms with that. You're just going to take yeah. the same stuff. Yeah. And that's why the whole point of this video is so you want a better relationship, more conscious relationship where there's courageous vulnerability. You got to do the U-turn and invest yeah. in your own personal mm -hmm. growth through mm -hmm. internal family systems. And then understand this masculine feminine polarity thing and the most importantly is understanding how the little girls or the little boys inside of you are going to naturally be hot and heavy attracted to someone that's going to remind you of the unfinished business from the caretaker that did you wrong and when we understand that it's like oh okay i understand that's why i'm so sexually attracted to that person and when you meet this person that's why it's so important to have these courageous vulnerable conversations mm -hmm. so that they begin to understand why you have this attraction and eventually you're going to get into a trigger mode mm -hmm. and knowing that beforehand to say okay how are we gonna na now mm -hmm. now we're navigating the little girls and the little boys that are now showing up in the relationship <laughs> yeah. and mm -hmm. that's what develops into really emotionally deep relationships the other thing i would say too is the change of energy in ourselves once we do that internal work puts us at a different vibration, like a different energy level that will attract somebody of a similar energy level. Doesn't mean our, they're our perfect match, but you start to get closer. Yep. Yeah. 
Right. And I, whatever you believe about, you know, the, the energy and what energy you're putting out there, what energy that you're receiving, in either way, if you are coming and bringing consciousness into a relationship, speaking for your own parts, being vulnerable, you'll eventually discover whether whoever you're dealing with is comfortable with that vulnerability, mm -hmm. is comfortable with that vulnerability themselves. It will just naturally go its own separate way if you're not comfortable with communicating on the same level. Yes. So really, being present, being vulnerable for your part, speaking for what's happening for you, allowing people to adjust to you, distance themselves from you, or grow closer to you mm -hmm. as, it, as it goes, as you go through the world. Mm -hmm. and and just let it happen. Yeah. Just let it happen. So yeah. if you're tired of difficult relationships repeating its patterns over and over again, it's time to just take a breather and go inward and work on yourself because mm -hmm. that is going to be the secret sauce to quantum leaping your love life to mm -hmm. a whole next level. Mm -hmm. And that's how you attract a more conscious partnership. Excellent. Excellent.